Well, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is um, how we are moving immunotherapy forward for our patients with colorectal cancer. Um, And over the next hour, I think we're going to be talking about a lot of really interesting areas of research for new treatments for patients, Um, but I'm really excited to be able to talk about immunotherapy in particular. Um, And so these are my disclosures. Um, And as we get started, I think one of the first things I want to emphasize is that immunotherapy is really not just one thing. Um, Over the last five to seven years, um, immunotherapy has become synonymous with a group of drugs that are called PD-1 inhibitors, um, which are drugs that we give to stimulate immune cells, um, but that's only one class of drugs. Um, Immunotherapy can also be vaccine-based therapy. Um, We are giving people um, cytokines, which are proteins that our body makes um, that stimulate the immune system. We are administering that to patients um, in order to stimulate people's immune system we're actually able to give immune cells as an infusion to patients, either um, their own immune cells that we activate or other people's immune cells or genetically engineered immune cells. So there's a lot that we're doing when it comes to immunotherapy. Um, We today are gonna talk predominantly about PD-1 therapy um, because that is the furthest along when we talk about this class of drugs. But I just wanna mention that there are really so many different areas that are pretty exciting when it comes to um, using the immune system against cancer. And similarly, colon cancer is not just one disease. Um, And we all know that every person's cancer is different. But what I want to emphasize when it comes to immunotherapy is that there are really two big buckets of cancer when it comes to colorectal cancer that act very differently when we think of the immune response to some of these drugs. There's a small little bucket of 5% of metastatic cancer patients. And that group of people are called microsatellite unstable or MSI high cancers. And again, that's only 5% of patients, but in that group of patients, the DNA in their tumor is actually unstable. That's what MSI means. And because of that, you get a whole bunch of mutations that are generated. So an MSI high cancer will have hundreds of mutations, whereas an MSS or microsatellite stable cancer is gonna actually only have um, a couple dozen mutations. And every single mutation is one more chance for the immune system to recognize that that cancer cell is different than the rest of your cells. Um, And because of that, MSI high cancers have been shown to be sensitive to immunotherapy. And in particular, what I'm talking about is PD-1 therapy. So PD-1 drugs are drugs that first were tested about a decade ago. Um, And you can think of PD-1 drugs as a break on the immune system. So PD-1, when it's on a cell and it binds to a PD-L1 receptor on the other cell, that turns off the immune system. It's a break. And so PD-1 inhibitors, they basically are lifting the, lifting up from that break. And so your immune system is able to really attack the cancer. Now in MSI high cancers, we have shown, and this is work that came out of Johns Hopkins from some of my, um, my friends and colleagues, Dr. Lee and Dr. Diaz, that PD-1 drugs are exquisitely sensitive um, when it comes to patients that have MSI high disease and can get PD-1 therapy. And so these drugs, and specifically pembrolizumab um, and now nivolumab, they're just cousins of each other, they are now approved for patients with MSI high colon cancer, but they're approved for people who have already had metastatic disease and they've already had chemotherapy. But this year, we have a new approval of immunotherapy for colon cancer. So this was really exciting work that came out earlier this year. And this was a trial that was, um, again, run by a similar group of people led by Dr. Diaz. um, And this was the Keynote 177 study. So this was reported just a few months ago um, and was, again, MSI high people, that 5% of patients with metastatic disease. But now these patients had never had chemotherapy before. So brand new diagnosis of um, metastatic cancer, and they were randomized to either getting the immunotherapy, which is the pembrolizumab, 
or getting chemotherapy with our standard chemotherapy options. And they followed these patients. And what they found, which they just reported, is that the people that got the immunotherapy, which is this um, teal colored um, curve here, they did so much better in terms of how long their disease was controlled. We call that progression-free survival. So the progression-free survival, the length of time someone's able to get a treatment before their disease progresses, was significantly longer than those who got chemotherapy, which is this maroon line. And even at the two-year mark, half of patients were still on that treatment and not having any growth of their cancer. So really exciting data. Um, this is what we call a waterfall plot. Um, and every one of these bars represents a single patient. And when the bar goes down, that means the tumor is shrinking. And what you can see is that there's significantly more tumor shrinkage for the patients that got the pembrolizumab than patients that got chemotherapy. Um, and if they had tumor shrinkage, this is how long it lasted, even at two years, 83% of people still had maintained disease control and shrinkage. And so um, really, really exciting data. And this has led the FDA to now approve pembrolizumab in the first line setting for our patients that are MSI high and have um, metastatic disease. But I don't want to forget about um, the biggest issue that we have confronting us right now when it comes to immunotherapy and colon cancer, and that is our other 95% of patients that have microsatellite stable or MSS disease. So that's what the entire um, immune apparatus of colorectal cancer is working on now is what can we do for MSS patients to get immunotherapy to work? So uh, this very complicated figure um, I've included really just so that I can talk about the complexity of what we're dealing with when it comes to generating a immune response in colorectal cancer. What you see is a group on the right versus on the left of the many different proteins and genes and chemicals that our body secretes that both activate um, the immune system or interact and depress the immune system. And we even have factors that are on both sides of this because depending on the context, the same protein can sometimes be good or sometimes be bad when it comes to um, immunotherapy working. So this shows how complicated the situation is and why we really might need something in combination to be able to really overcome a lot of this complexity. And one of the big areas that people are looking at is combining immune drugs with drugs that target especially abnormal proteins in colon cancer. And this might be particularly beneficial for patients that have a certain molecular mutation in their tumor DNA. For example, about 7% of colon cancer has mutations in BRAF. And so colleagues of mine um, at the Harvard institutions, Dr. Corcoran, Dr. Parikh, and their colleagues have actually investigated the idea of taking patients that have BRAF mutations, giving them a drug, a BRAF inhibitor that inhibits that, along with a MEK inhibitor, which is another class of drugs that works for those patients, and putting it together with immunotherapy, which is the PD-1 drug we've been talking about. And on the right here, I want to show you what it is that we look at um, as scientists when we're trying to figure out what should we move forward into patients. So this is a graph that looks at implanted tumors in mice. And these tumors had this BRAF mutation. And the black line here is showing what happens when the tumor is allowed to grow unchecked. But the other lines, especially the blue line here at the bottom, shows how that tumor growth gets completely stopped when you give it a, a BRAF inhibitor in combination with a PD-1 inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor. And this kind of data is what compels us to then say, hey, let's move this forward and try this in patients. And so Dr. Corcoran's group did exactly that, and they have enrolled a BRAF mutation positive study for patients with this mutation with that triplet of a immunotherapy drug and two targeted drugs, a BRAF inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor. Um, and what they show is also pretty compelling. 
It's really early data, only a handful of patients, right? 21 patients have been enrolled. But this is that same kind of waterfall plot showing many patients who are having tumor shrinkage or even some shrinkage or disease stabilization while they're getting this kind of a strategy. And on the right here, this is just one more way that we show data where we show how long people stay on treatment. So this is the number of days and weeks that a person stays on treatment. Every bar represents a patient, and you can see that many of these patients are staying on treatment um, at an average about six months, and that average means many patients are doing uh, better than six months in terms of their disease doing well on this treatment. I am also partial to this other example of a combination approach for immunotherapy. Um, I'm partial to it because this is something that we are running here at Johns Hopkins. Um, and again, why did we decide on this particular approach of trying to combine a PD-1 inhibitor with a drug called a PI3 kinase inhibitor? Now, PI3 kinase is a mutation that is present in about 15 to 20 percent of colon cancer, and so. And a collaborator in the laboratory, Dr. Collins, looked at, could we predict which mutations that patients have might predict for them to be more resistant or more sensitive to immunotherapy? So again, we take a group of mice and we implant tumors that have various mutations. And then we look at those mice and those tumors and we score each mutation. That's what this graph is showing. And each mutation that had a PI3 kinase actually seemed more resistant to immunotherapy than other tumors. And then Dr. Collins goes back into the lab and treats those mutations with a combination of a PI3 kinase inhibitor and a PD-1 inhibitor. And when you treat Without the PI3 kinase inhibitor that's here on the left, these tumors grow. The PD-1 inhibitor, it's totally resistant to it. That's what the red line is. But here on the right, when you combine them with a PI3 kinase inhibitor and an immunotherapy drug, now the tumors aren't growing. So based on this, we are moving forward in a clinical trial for patients that have PI3 kinase mutations, giving them the PI3 kinase inhibitor, copanlisib with nivolumab, which is one of the PD-1 inhibitors, just a different company than um, pembrolizumab. Um, but uh, this is an exciting trial that we hope um, to report out next year. Now, there are other groups that are really excited about the idea of using radiation to activate the immune system. And the idea here is that if you hit a cancer cell with radiation and break that cell open, it's gonna spill its insides and the insides of a cancer cell are things that the immune system hasn't seen because it's been kept inside of the cell. And now these are the immune cells here, the dendritic cell and the T cell. Now those cells are gonna recognize these inside components of that and they're gonna activate. And so you use radiation more because it bursts some cells open and allows the immune system to activate against the cancer. And so this clinical trial um, led by Ted Hong, a radiation oncologist, um, has also been really exciting in terms of the data that has been um, shown. Looking at nivolumab and ipilimumab, this is, these are both immunotherapy drugs. Patients received six weeks of treatment and then they got low doses of radiation, again, just to activate the immune system. And then they continued to get the immunotherapy afterwards. They did see some patients that had real responses, some tumor shrinkage that was durable um, for these patients. But the challenge on their trial was that for six weeks, the patients got immunotherapy alone. And we know that immunotherapy with these immune checkpoints alone doesn't work in MSS colon cancer. So a lot of patients came off the study before they could even get their radiation. Um, so this was 13 of the patients that weren't able to get the, immuno, uh, get the radiation. And so it really compromises our ability to know if because we have less numbers. So now they're actually going to um, enroll more patients where they get the radiation up front. And I'm really excited to get um, those results um, where we're able to treat more patients with that kind of a strategy. Um, 
the people that did get responses um, really did have um, a long time of being able to have their disease under control. As you can see here, um, the plus signs show people who are still on treatment at the time this was reported. So this is pretty exciting. Um, small group of patients, but I'm, I'm hopeful that with the bigger study, we'll see more. And finally, before I end, I really wanted to highlight some exciting vaccine-based approaches that have been um, moving forward. Um, and really, the idea is, can we make a personalized vaccine against one given patient's cancer? How do we select the right components to put in the vaccine? And so my colleague, Dr. Zaidi, who's going to be on a panel um, in just a few minutes, um, has been really working on this um, concept in a way that I think is um, really, really exciting. So what she proposes is that you biopsy a tumor, you sequence that tumor. So you find out what mutations it has in the DNA, look at the RNA, which is the, the part of it that makes it into protein proteins, and then you use a computer algorithm to predict which of the mutations in that tumor are going to be most likely to stimulate the immune system, because some mutations are more likely to stimulate the immune system than others, just because of the way that mutation um, actually has that sequence. And then you create a vaccine made out of the the mutations that are most likely to generate an immune response. Um, and so this has been done in melanoma, and they were able to show that when you create a personalized vaccine to a patient's tumor, that the, each one of these little dots that you see here on the right represents an immune cell population that's activated um, against one of these mutations. And so it worked in melanoma. Can we make it work in colon cancer and GI cancers? So this is Dr. Zaidi, who you're going to um, meet very soon, and she used a pancreatic cancer model to demonstrate in the lab that this could be done. She sequenced a pancreatic cancer model. She found that these 12 mutations were most likely to generate an immune response. And then she created a vaccine and vaccinated the mice. First, they got tumor um, that was implanted, and then they were vaccinated with this personalized vaccine, along with immune checkpoint inhibition. And here in the purple, what you see is when you get the vaccine alone, that wasn't enough for the mice to have the tumors be controlled. But when you started adding immunotherapy, every line here represents one mouse and one tumor. Now you started to see shrinkage in those tumors, and that increased when you added um, more immunotherapy in. So this has been um, the backdrop of us moving forward with a trial that's going to open next year, and um, we hope in the next three to four months. Um, where patients who have brand new metastatic colon cancer will get a biopsy. We will sequence those biopsies. We will predict which mutations are most likely to generate immune response, and we will generate a vaccine to that patient's tumor. Meanwhile, the patient will be going on and getting their standard chemotherapy. And then after about four months, once their tumor is stable and we have a vaccine in hand, we will vaccinate patients with a personalized vaccine along with immune checkpoint inhibition like a PD-1 inhibitor. Um, and so this trial is approved and we are in the last steps of just optimizing our process to make the vaccine. We're very excited to, um, to move forward with this in the early next year. Dr. Zaidi has also activated a trial um, that we've been working on together, looking at a KRAS vaccine. Um, and so 40% of colon cancer has a mutation in KRAS. Dr. Zaidi has created a vaccine that is to the six most common KRAS mutations. The vaccine is the same, so it's an off-the-shelf vaccine, meaning that each vaccine is identical, but it's only given to people who have one of these six mutations. And what we're doing is using this to help patients' cancer not come back after they've already had surgery. So in this setting, patients have already had their tumor removed, but they have a high risk of recurrence. This would be a patient who had a metastatic tumor removed, or they have a lot of lymph nodes involved. And so after they finish their chemotherapy, they'll move on and get 
um, this KRAS vaccine in combination with nivolumab and ibulumumab, which are the um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and this will happen um, over the course of a year. So they'll be getting vaccines and immunotherapy for a year. And our goal is to show that they don't have any recurrence after that. And so with that, I'm going to conclude. Um, I hope that I've shown you that while we have a lot of complexity in dealing with the cancer that we have and trying to generate an immune response, there are so many exciting approaches that are being um, pursued right now. Um, and the most important thing is that everyone that has the opportunity should be looking at clinical trials early. They should be looking at them often because we do have a lot of different strategies to test. And the more patients that are involved, the better chance we're going to be able to find hopefully not just one, but multiple approaches that can work for patients. Thank you very much. And next up, we have a really exciting panel, What's Next in Personalized Therapy for Colorectal Cancer Patients, moderated by Dr. Chloe Atreya from UCSF. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us. I am Dr. Chloe Atreya, an associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco, Helen Diller Family Camp Comprehensive uh, Cancer Center in the gastroenterology group, um, gastrointestinal oncology group, sorry. Um, I will moderate our first panel discussion on what is new in personalized therapy and review recent innovations in biomarker therapy, including KRAS, BRAF, and general precision services. I'll start today with Dr. Niha Zaidi, physician, scientist, and medical oncologist at the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Zaidi. And tell me, what are some recent developments in precision immunotherapy for common mutations in colorectal cancer, such as KRAS? Well, thank you, Dr. Atreya, for the introduction. And it's my pleasure today to speak to you all about uh, new precision approaches for targeting uh, mutated KRAS. Um, so what we know and what we've learned over the last couple of decades, um, although KRAS mutations have been known um, for a long time now, um, is that uh, KRAS are really drivers of cancer growth um, and mutations in KRAS are can uh, drivers of cancer growth and are really critical for cancer cells to grow and survive. In colorectal cancer specifically, they're present in about 45% of cases of colorectal cancers. And in general, um, in patients with advanced colorectal cancer, uh, mutations in KRAS um, confer worse prognosis and treatment resistance to standard chemotherapies. And that's why really novel um, treatment approaches are desperately needed for this subset of colorectal cancers that have a KRAS mutation. And not only that, but we've also learned over the past 15 years or so um, is that the presence of KRAS mutations actually impact the treatment options that we as medical oncologists have to offer our patients. And it's now become um, standard practice to test for mutations in KRAS um, along with similar uh, types of mutations in BRAF, um, which you'll hear about. Um, later, and it's standard of care to get this test done in patients, again, with advanced uh, disease. And this is because um, certain KRAS mutations in patients with advanced disease do not respond um, well to a class of drugs that are commonly used in metastatic colorectal cancer, and these are anti-EGFR antibodies. So not only um, does KRAS tell us a little bit about the prognosis in patients with advanced cancer, but also helps us to understand what treatment options we have based on the presence of certain KRAS mutations. So testing done in advanced disease is actually um, standard of care. Um, so KRAS itself um, is a protein that is expressed, mutation, mutated KRAS is a protein um, expressed in advanced disease. And until recently, it was taught to be um, undruggable, um, and numerous attempts to block or inhibit this protein have been tested in labs and clinical trials, but really um, have been largely unsuccessful over decades. And this is really because of the physiochemical properties of this protein that have made it very, very challenging to actually uh, find a druggable 
um, uh, success. Um, and this is uh, up until recently, and really not until over the last couple of years have there really been early promising results in inhibiting KRAS. And I'm giving you one of uh, two or three examples that have been recently looked at. One of them is a KRAS G12C inhibitor. Um, and this was data that was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but these inhibitors um, were tested in a phase one clinical trial that looked at the safety um, of this drug at, at various doses. And this was tested in lung cancer, which also um, has uh, a high prevalence of KRAS mutations, as well as colorectal cancer and several other solid tumors. And what was found was that this drug was safe and actually did show some activity in uh, mostly in the lung cancer, but also a little bit in the colorectal cancer group. So this was really has been the first uh, promising study that we've seen over years in which KRAS has been successfully inhibited. In terms of colorectal cancer specifically, um, recent studies have looked at why um, it works so well in lung cancer and why it doesn't work as well in colorectal cancer. And um, a recent study has suggested that perhaps we need to combine this KRAS G12C inhibitor with other inhibitors uh, for a more successful outcome. So I'm I think we'll see a lot more in terms of combinations of drugs um, to successfully inhibit uh, KRAS, which up until recently was really thought to be an undruggable target for colorectal cancer. So this has been um, one of the most promising um, studies that have, have come out in terms of KRAS. Um, additionally, although uh, not specifically are KRAS inhibitors, there are other drugs that seem to be more sensitive in patients that have a KRAS mutation. And one of these is a PLK1 inhibitor. And this preferentially seems to be more uh, effective in patients uh, with advanced colorectal cancer who have a KRAS mutation. And it's currently being studied in the second line in patients with metastatic disease and has shown some early safety uh, data and some uh, anti-cancer activity. And finally, I'm just gonna take the last couple of minutes to talk about my personal interest, which is exploiting the immune system to target KRAS. So instead of directly inhibiting KRAS, what we want to do is to educate our own immune system to recognize mutated KRAS as, as, as a foreign body in our, uh, that, that needs to be detected by the immune system and killed off. And so um, we've learned a lot about uh, how we can manipulate the immune system against cancer. And one of the earliest studies that have exploited KRAS specifically um, uh, showed us proof of concept that we could indeed use the, our own immune system to target KRAS expressing cancer cells. And um, very briefly, this study uh, was uh, performed at the NCI, and um, this was a patient with colorectal cancer in which the scientists were able to isolate T cells, which are the most important um, part of our immune system in killing cancer cells that were specific for mutated KRAS. They were actually be able to isolate them outside of the patient expand them and then reinfuse them into the patient. And what you're seeing um, in, the, in the images on the right are, are CT scans of lung lesions, of metastatic colon cancer lesions that, have, that were regressed with, uh, with this type of therapy. So this was one of the earliest proof of concept studies that we could perhaps target KRAS um, using uh, an, an novel immunotherapies. And since then, we and others have looked at vaccines um, that correspond to uh, mutated KRAS proteins to actually educate the immune system like we do for the flu vaccine or other uh, vaccines against uh, viral infections to recognize mutated KRAS as foreign um, in order to kill these KRAS expressing cancer cells. And our group in particular has combined a vaccine that we've developed with um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, which you may have heard about in the last session that actually take the breaks off of our immune system. 
because what the cancer is able to do is to uh, put uh, is is able to hide from the immune system by putting up these breaks, which checkpoint inhibitors um, can take off. So we believe that we probably need um, a two-step pr process first with uh, something like a vaccine to educate our immune system to recognize uh, KRAS as foreign. And then the second step is to effectively activate these T cells to actually go into the cancer and kill these um, cancer cells that have a KRAS target. And so um, this is something that um, is being actively developed. And I think both um, inhibitors as well as immunotherapy approaches can be used um, to, uh, to target uh, mutated KRAS, which previously, again, was uh, a very difficult and undruggable target. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. Thank you, Dr. Zaidi, for um, sharing this exciting and important new research on targeting KRAS mutated colorectal cancer. I now want to introduce Mark Delaney, a patient survivor who is currently in treatment for metastatic colorectal cancer. Mark, uh, thanks for joining us today to share your story. As a patient who has gone through this, can you tell us about how biomarker testing has impacted your treatment journey? What do you want uh, our listeners to know? Thank you very much for the question, and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to participate. Uh, as a patient who's undergoing treatment, it's always a uh, hopeful uh, and somewhat, you know, uh, gives comfort uh, to know that uh, you know the doctors and the scientists are, uh, you know, aggressively. Uh, chasing options to, to help us who are uh, undergoing treatment. Again, my name is Mark Delaney. I was uh, diagnosed with uh, stage four colon cancer in October of 2016 uh, with a liver metastasis. Um, and, you know, as a patient, when you go through that, you know, obviously you get the diagnosis. It was uh, earth shattering to say the least. Uh, and then, you know, I immediately jump into, okay, well, they're doing all the testing. And one of the first things I had done was I had a liver biopsy uh, performed and they did all the testing for Lynch syndrome, uh, microsatellite uh, instability, uh, and uh, the biomarkers. And I came back with KRAS uh, wild type, uh, which uh, the doctors will keep me honest here, I think means I, I didn't have any uh, uh, mutation. Uh, and at the time, you know, it didn't really mean much to me. Uh, you know, I didn't understand what the benefit or the lack of ben uh, 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 lack of benefit would be having uh, just KRAS wild type. And so I had surgery in 2017, finished my first cycle uh, in the summer of 2017. And then December of 2017, it unfortunately came back uh, to my peritoneum. Uh, and at the time I went to, uh, my, uh, oncologist, uh, Dr. Saltz at Sloan. And he said, well, look, you know, the fact that you have this KRAS, uh, wild, uh, actually is good because we have drugs that are applicable to that. Uh, namely, uh, the brand names are Avastin and, uh, Vectabix. Uh, and so again, the comfort of knowing that there was an option, uh, as a patient, you're obviously terrified that, you know, you, you read enough on Dr. Google, as I like to call, and, you know, you don't want to run through the lines of therapy, uh, too fast. Uh, and there's only so many lines and, you know, the prognosis, uh, obviously I'm on stage four, so it's, uh, you know, uh, palliative therapy at this point, there is no cure. So you want to understand what the longevity is, uh, and your options. And, you know, at the time, so Dr. Salt said, well, look, we can go either with Avastin, or we can go with Vectabix. And, you know, he said he really didn't have a particular preference. And he asked me and uh, Vectabix uh, has an associated uh, rash for anybody who's had it, obviously knows that, or if anybody's uh, planning to have it. And so he said, let's start with Avastin. And that was in January of 2018. Uh, fast forward to, you know, October of 2020, I've had 44 rounds of Fulfurian Avastin. I believe the way they categorize my disease, I have responsive disease, which means when I'm on my treatment, everything shrinks, everything's doing well. And then when I get off uh, my treatment, things start to grow back. So the KRAS, you know, the KRAS wild, uh, you know, in retrospect, obviously that was a little blessing in my cancer journey to know that I had wild type, uh, as Dr. Zaidi uh, said earlier, you know, uh, previously the mutations uh, didn't have options and had a poor, uh, prognosis, but so KRAS impacted me, uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, I feel very fortunate, uh, to have a KRAS wild type and incredibly fortunate, uh, to, uh, 
know that there are drugs and I even still have another option uh, for that with the, the Vectabix uh, uh, whenever, uh, which hopefully won't be a long time, whenever uh, the Avastin uh, and Fulfury combo seems to uh, stop working. So, uh, so that's kind of been my journey, uh, you know, uh, and, and, you know, right now for me, KRAS has been kind of a, a lifesaver in terms of knowing that biomarker. And so, you know, at the time when I got that tested in uh, 2016, you know, I had no idea what it was. I, you know, nobody made a big deal about it. Uh, but now looking back and understanding where I am and you know, uh, understanding your biomarker is probably a requirement for every cancer patient. Thank you, Mark, so much for sharing your story and for providing hope to our listeners. Um, it certainly sounds like you've also been living through this, this cancer journey, which I, um, I, I think sh- should also provide hope uh, to live during, during this treatment. Um, next up, uh, we have Dr. Rona Yeager, Associate Attending Physician at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Yeager. Dr. Yeager, um, what new therapies are available for listeners who might have a BRAF V600E mutation or another BRAF mutation? Thank you very much. Um, It's a pleasure to join the panel and to give an update on treatment for BRAF uh, mutated colorectal cancer. So I just wanted to first start talking about what's the frequency of alterations in BRAF um, within colorectal cancers. So we've heard so far this morning about mutations in KRAS and inside RAS. And here you can see a pie chart with the frequency of um, the mutations in RAS or BRAF. And what you can see is, as Mark said, many patients are wild type for mutations in RAS um, or BRAF, about um, just under half of patients are wild type. And about 45% of colorectal patients have mutations in the KRAS or NRAS, so the RAS genes. And that leaves about 10% of patients with colorectal cancer who have a BRAF mutation in their tumor. Most of those mutations are the BRAF V600E mutation, which is what we call a hotspot because it re- occurs recurrently in human cancer. It occurs in colorectal cancer as well as other cancers. About a quarter of the BRAF mutations we see in colorectal cancer occur outside of the V600E site. And so we think of them as non-V600 BRAF alterations. I wanted to spend a moment talking about BRAF V600E, um, especially because it has unique clinical characteristics and there are treatments now approved for BRAF V600E mutated colorectal cancer. So first, some of the clinical characteristics. So patients with BRAF V600E colorectal cancer tend to be older in age. It's more common among women. Um, And it's more common on the right side of the colon. What that means is the colon is like an upside down U with it starting um, on the bottom of this kind of upside down U and the right side is the first half. And what we call the left side is that second half. And we've talked about, and you may have heard about, there's a rising incidence of colorectal cancer among young patients. And that is primarily actually the tumors that are very distal, what we call the left side or the rectum, while right-sided tumors tend to occur uh, more commonly in older patients, and there's a clear predominance of the KRAS, NRAS, and BRAF mutations um, on the right side, as opposed to left-sided tumors, which I'm assuming that Mark uh, probably has, that tend to uh, have be wild type for those biomarkers. We also see an association between BRAF V600E and microsatellite instability. And microsatellite instability means that the tumor um, has more mutations and tumors that are microsatellite unstable can respond to immunotherapy. And about a third of the BRAF V600 mutated colorectal cancer are microsatellite unstable. So those patients would have the option of being treated with immunotherapy and potentially nice responses to that. Um, Most importantly, as we think about BRAF E600, um, it's um, associated with more aggressive disease, um, tends to be a poor prognostic marker. Um, In contrast with, as we were talking about having a RAS wild type tumor, but hopefully as we come up with treatments um, that we will see that change. The BRAF V600E mutation is associated with an abdominal spread with involvement of the peritoneum and with um, uh, the potential to have fluid in the belly. And so patients can get distended and they can have obstruction. Um, so that, that's something to think about, especially as the drugs that I'm gonna tell you about are all oral. And 
if a patient start, um, waits to start the drugs until they're very ill um, and have received all treatment before, sometimes it's an issue where they may have some bowel symptoms um, already. So um, I I'll go through some of the data, but most of these drugs have been developed in patients who've received one line, meaning one type of chemo already. So we, um, I often at that point think, is this a good time to use targeted therapy? So to think about these drugs, I have a cartoon that walks us through what BRAF is doing and um, includes some of the players that we've been talking about so far, but understanding this pathway will um, help us see what are the targets that we're hitting. So normally in our cells, um, we have the outside of the cell that senses um, if they're nutrients, and that will give a signal to the cell that walks from the outside surface through the uh, in, inside the cytoplasm of the cell to get to the nucleus to say, this is a good time to grow, this is a good time to proliferate, and the cells should survive. This is a program that's involved in cell growth, so is often co-opted by cancer cells and often is abnormal within colorectal cancer. And in fact, we've heard about it today when we talk about what's a RAS mutation. So that's the protein that's activated um, when we have these growth signals from outside that will turn on um, the signal to say, hey, it's a good time to grow. And BRAF mutations do the same um, and also turn on the same pathway. Um, normally, this kind of goes through this progression from the outside. And what RAS does is it causes um, RAF, or BRAF is a type of RAF, to come together. So we have here, you see the two separate RAF molecules come together, which allows RAF to turn on. So what BRAF V600E mutation does is that it is turned on all the time. It doesn't matter what's going on outside the cell and gives a continuous signal for growth. And the way it does that is that the V600E BRAF can signal as a monomer. That means a single protein. It no longer needs to pair and it no longer needs RAS to get it to pair. And so it's on all the time. Um, and that's, um, uh, and we think that in patients who have that mutation, that's a driving force for the cancer. Um, we have heard about, you heard about Vectabix, which is an EGFR antibody. So in patients who ha don't have mutations in this pathway, we can target up here and target EGFR. But in patients who already have activation, we have to hit what's being activated or lower um, to get to stop that growth signal. So initially, when um, drugs were developed for um, BRAF, those drugs um, seem to have efficacy based on bindings preferentially to RAF when it singles as a, signals as a monomer, that's that single protein, um, allowing them to get into patients and um, uh, have less side effects um, as opposed to if they hit all, RAF, all forms of RAF. And when it was tested, some of these BRAF inhibitors, which you may have heard of, such as Vemurafenib or Encorafenib, they have um, they were found um, as they were tested across cancer types to have high activity in certain settings such as melanoma. But surprisingly in colorectal cancer with the V600E mutation, the same mutation, they were seen to have low activity. And initially it wasn't clear why, this was an area that became a big focus of research. And now our understanding is that there's just a lot more of these receptors on the surface in the colon. So it's not enough just to give the BRAF drug. You have to hit BRAF and the receptor together. Um, and usually now, in, um, um, following this work, there have been many trials looking at giving a BRAF drug together with an EGFR blocker. Not only do we need to give the drugs to better block the pathway, if we have the receptor working, it leads to the RAS activation, and then we get this pairing of RAF where the BRAF drug doesn't work as well because it works better when BRAF, like V600E BRAF, is signaling as a monomer, so it works better when it's in a monomer form. So based on this data, there have been trials that have shown better activity when you combine the receptor inhibitor with the BRAF inhibitor, which set the stage for the BEACON trial. The BEACON trial was a phase three trial, meaning it went for um, FDA approval. Um, and it's a randomized three-arm study where patients who had a BRAF B600E, metastatic colorectal cancer, that had grown through at least, that had progressed through at least one line of chemotherapy were randomized into either receiving standard therapy, which is an EGFR antibody, cetuximab or Herbitux, together with chemotherapy, or receiving the EGFR antibody together with a BRAF, with the BRAF inhibitor, encorafenib, or with encorafenib plus a MEK inhibitor. 
And what the study found, the primary endpoint that they were looking at was, does giving the targeted therapy help patients live longer? They found that either the doublet or the triplet of the targeted therapy help patients live longer than the standard chemotherapy with the EGFR inhibitor. So just a moment about these um, treatments. So these are targeted therapies. Um, they're a little different um, than our standard chemotherapy. As Mark mentioned, commonly patients can develop rash when you give these EGFR antibodies. The targeted therapies tend to work quickly. So patients who start treatment and have pain within a few days can often feel improvement if they're responding to treatment. They have unique side effects. So when we do these combination treatments like the BRAF inhibitor and the EGFR inhibitor, we find that the BRAF drug, which acts differently in normal cells where we don't have that single um, BRAF monomer, has an opposing effect of the EGFR antibody. So we still see rash, but the rash tends to be mild. Um, other common uh, side effects would be fatigue, which is also often mild, and some GI effects such as nausea and diarrhea. So overall, it's been a great achievement that now we have an FDA-approved treatment for patients with BRAF V600E, mutated colorectal cancer. However, not all patients respond, and the response often, um, uh, um, while can be um, uh, lead to clear symptomatic improvement, um, it doesn't last forever. Over time, the patient, uh, tumor finds a way to outsmart these drugs. So there's a lot of research now to understand what's going on. How can we help patients respond better and respond longer and maybe with new drugs help um, have more patients respond? So I want to take my last moment to talk about non-V600 BRAF alterations. So we talked about BRAF V600E that signals as a monomer. Well, the non-V600 BRAF, they can dimerize, they can come as a pair without needing the activation for RAS. And there are two groups, some that just dimerize on their own, so they're just turned on all the time, and some that bind more tightly to RAS to lead to more activation. So we're hopeful that some of these um, new uh, BRAF inhibitors may have activity um, regardless of whether BRAF is a monomer or it's paired as a dimer. And also, um, there's a potential that some of these BRAF um, mutations may affect response to the known drugs such as EGFR antibodies. So those that bind to RAS more tightly and are uh, activated because of a signal coming from EGFR may respond better to the EGFR antibodies. So knowing what a mutation is in, in your tumor may help guide what treatments to receive and also open options for clinical trials. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yeager, for that excellent discussion. Um, I do want to put a special plug in for clinical trials that are combining BRAF targeted therapies with, um, with immunotherapies, and also to encourage any patients um, who may be listening who have stage four metastatic colorectal cancer to have their tumors tested early for KRAS and RAS and BRAF B600E mutations as well as mismatch repair or microsatellite instability to determine what standard of care and clinical trial options that they may be, that you may be eligible for. Um, and so next um, up, we have um, Gary Gregory, who is CEO of Perthera, a healthcare artificial intelligence company advancing precision medicine. Gary, um, as physicians and patients use information about biomarkers to fight colorectal cancer, how might Perthera's precision medicine platform help to improve outcomes and ultimately save lives? Thank you, Dr. Atreya, for the introduction and, and for the opportunity to speak alongside a number of leading physicians and also uh, a patient in the midst of a, of a courageous fight against colorectal cancer. Mark, I'd like to commend you for your courage in your battle and also in coming forward to bring awareness to other patients who are, who are uh, in a similar effort to uh, fight colorectal cancer and, and achieve a positive outcome in their life. That's really an inspirational tale and, and your efforts here are noteworthy as well as the efforts of these oncologists who are uh, leading efforts every single day for patients to do well in the battle against colorectal cancer. Today, we're gonna to tell you a little bit about Perthera. We've got an exciting announcement in our work with uh, Colorectal Cancer Alliance. And um, you know we're really pleased to give you an overview on Perthera as a company and our partnership with CCA. And Perthera is focused on empowering physicians and patients with precision medicine. 
And our goal is to help both physicians and patients to fully capitalize on the cancer care opportunities, utilizing precision oncology to prove outcomes and lives for patients. A little bit on Prothera, we're a precision oncology outcomes company. That's how we're being known and, and seen in the marketplace. With 10 years of experience, we've been used by over 250 cancer centers across the country, and over 10% of uh, practicing oncologists have taken advantage of the Prothera out, uh, platform. And the neat thing about it is it's been proven to advance treatment decisions and patient outcomes, as we'll talk a little bit about today. From a big picture, um, you've heard uh, in this review this afternoon, great insights on the power of precision medicine. And to distill it, sometimes it's good to step back and say, what is precision medicine? And really what it is from our vantage is an approach to allow patient care where doctors are selecting treatments that are precisely matched to the patients based on their molecular profile and the physician's understanding of their disease, the patient's individual disease. And for us, at Prothera, we're looking to count, combine the power of science, medicine, and data to advance the use of precision oncology. Um, from a, a big picture, what our Prothera Precision Oncology platform does is allow oncologists to make very informed precision medicine decisions to help patients achieve the, ba the best outcomes. And there are certain things in our platform that we do that uh, combined with some of the things that Mark talked about. He had and mentioned how he had molecular profile tests done. And so what Prothera does, we're not a laboratory, but we integrate all of the data available and then bring that back, that data back to the physician and, and, the, and, the, and the patients for the appropriate care decisions and direction of optimal outcomes. And what we have in our platform that's unique is we integrate the patient's past medical and treatment history, a multi-omics approach. We'll look at genomics, proteomics, germline, new things like phosphoproteins. We have a therapeutic engine that's been developed over a bunch of years, which has artificial intelligence and machine learning in it. An expert medical review or a tumor board, as it's often called, applied to each and every patient. Rank therapy recommendations that are provided that, that give the physician direction that is not a laundry list of options that they're considering, but truly ranked options that we'll talk a little bit about. And last but not least, it's been proven and published to advance outcomes. And uh, we follow the patient longitudinally to ensure that we have a backstop for you and your, your fight against cancer. And towards that, we believe based on what we've seen from a company perspective, in addition to the great work being done by physicians, but as a company, uh, we're the only precision oncology platform that integrates all of these elements. And so one thing that's really interesting to think about as you approach your fight against colorectal cancer and as physicians are taking that battle on in a first line stance is that as you look at the various types of cancer, there's uh, different tests that can be done. There can be DNA or genomic tests done. There can be protein tests done that are called proteomics. There's other test markers called things like RNA or phosphoproteins. And if you look at colon cancer or colorectal cancer, the, the use of both genomics and proteomics, they have, depending on the cancer type and the individual, varied in, um, indicators from both genomics and proteomics, and even some of these other markers that are either in real term or on near term horizon. So having the broadest profile done when you're being tested and evaluated in terms of your cancer is really an important thing for patients. And at Prothera, we facilitate that by following the direction of whatever outlines each individual physician wants to pursue. And then what we do is, as this tagline here implies, the physician or the patient can also have the test ordered, order the test, and Prothera does the rest. And to give you a little bit behind the scenes on what we do, which is this is the rest of it, the first thing we do is we coordinate it. A doctor will order a test and we'll make sure that we get, again, that multiomic approach, genomics, proteomics, germline phosphoproteins, whatever the doctor specifies, and we certainly have recommendations because that's what we practice and work on every day. Our patient coordinators will get all of that information along with your past medical and treatment history, and that is then run through our therapeutic intelligence engine, 
which is a, you know, a computer system and computational engine that has 10 databases, 50,000 plus heuristic rules and algorithms, and artificial intelligence and machine learning, which produce an initial set of rank therapies. And then what's really neat is that we then run those rank therapies through a, a, an expert molecular tumor board that is done for every patient every time we run a Prothera uh, analysis. And we use both internal experts, but also external experts from across the country, featuring physicians like those who were speaking on today's panel. And they will polish those rankings to make sure that we have an expert in the loop looking at what has been driven off of, in essence, our AI computational engine. And what that produces is a Prothera report that will literally rank from top to bottom the most favorable online, offline, and clinical trial options. And as mentioned earlier, clinical trials are so important in fighting colorectal cancer, and our platform has been proven to increase clinical trial enrollment by five times the national average. So it gives you an additional step forward in your fight against uh, colorectal cancer. And then the last thing is that when you use this platform, it's been proven in publications that we'll talk about today that have improved not only overall survival, but progression free survival for patients. And we track the outcomes, each individual patient's outcomes longitudinally and utilize those outcomes for not only your backstop and your care, but also with your consent, use them in a de-identified manner to advance research, science, and efforts to fight colorectal cancer. So that's the platform in a nutshell. I'll give you a quick look at our report. This report is different than what you would get through the traditional molecular labs. And again, we complement those. You still might use some of the major labs or the labs that are in a hospital um, that the doctor would direct and typically order. But then what comes back is this Prothera report, which has literally ranked options A, B, C, on-label, off-label, and clinical trials for the physician to make the decisions on your care. But what's really neat about this is with this engine, 80% of the time physicians will choose our top three options and over 70% of the time they'll choose our top ranked option as a care pathway. And we can be very accurate and precise in this, not only because we're taking this multiomic approach, not only because we're using um, uh, a, our artificial intelligence and computational engine, but also because we have an expert in the loop and are factoring in your past medical and treatment history. And that's how we create such a precise roadmap that in essence gives the doctor more of a GPS than a Rand McNally roadmap that they might get from a lab report here and a lab report there. It's all integrated in one place to help them make better uh, decisions in precision oncology. And to illustrate that, this was a publication in Lancet Oncology and another form of GI cancer, pancreatic cancer, which is one of the most deadly forms of cancer. And in over 1,100 patients, um, you see here that the patients who received the matched therapies from the Prothera report versus either unmatched or no, mark, no biomarkers, um, we have a one-year difference uh, in uh, the uh, um, overall survival rates for patients and a 2.4 time increase in progression-free survival. So it's a dramatic impact. And when we look at these large cohorts of patients, it becomes really clear that when physicians take advantage of the Prothera platform, patients frankly live longer and do better. Um, so it's really exciting and something we're really proud of. And it puts so much sci uh, science and medicine and efforts in over the years. This is a little bit of a snapshot of the hospitals and the biopharma companies we have worked with who, help, uh, who ask us to help accelerate trial recruitment. And most importantly, advocacy groups from across the land who have said, show us how we can bring precision medicine forward to our patients and show the uh, power and impact of the uh, precision oncology efforts, uh, precision medicine in essence for patient outcomes. And so with that, on my last note here, we wanted to announce today a 500 patient program study that is being done with Colorectal Cancer Alliance to advance patient care and clinical findings. And here we'll deliver the Prothera report and platform to physicians across the land to utilize and to patients like yourself. So if there's anyone out there who has either been molecularly profiled or is about to be molecularly profiled, you can contact us. We'll enroll you in the program. We'll reach out to your physician as well and engage them in the process. 
And in our efforts, we look to not only drive improved patient outcomes as we've done in other forms of cancer, but also educate patients on utilizing the power of precision oncology. We'll match the therapies and clinical trial options specific to each patient's individual cancer dynamics. And last but not least, dramatically advanced research in colo colorectal cancer as we aim to discover new pathways, many of which, which we are talking about today. And the beauty of this program in working with CCA is that we're doing this at no cost to patients and oncologists across the country. So it creates a really unique ecosystem, if you will, where you can participate and have direct benefit in your own cancer care via the, the Prothera report that we talked about, our outreach to your physicians for their utilization of the technology, and also in impacting a broader study with 500 patients or more that we plan to enroll in this program. And that will deliver some really key findings for the physicians who are leading this investigator initiated effort under CCA's efforts. So that's a quick overview on Prothera. Hopefully I didn't give you too much data, go too fast or too slow here. But um, again, please note this program is just being announced today. Enrollment is free. You can contact us at an email of hope at Prothera, a phone number here, which is at our website. Or if you go to our website, there'll be a specific page that's outlining the program and how it's available to uh, the CCA uh, members out in, uh, in this program and, and beyond. So very excited to uh, have the opportunity to work alongside the panel today, talk a little bit about Prothera and our breakthrough approach in advancing precision oncology for physicians and, and patients and the great fight to, uh, to address and end colorectal cancer. Thanks so much for your time, appreciate it. Thank you, Gary, for introducing the Prothera Integrated Precision Medicine Platform and for this exciting announcement for the benefit of colorectal cancer patients. I want to once more um, give a special thank, thank you to all of our panelists today, Dr. Zadie, Dr. Yeager, and Gary Gregory for sharing the latest in colorectal cancer research and technology, and to Mark Delaney for sharing your experience as a patient. Now, please tune into the next recorded segment, Liver-Directed Therapy, presented by Andrea Sersik. And this panel will be available after Dr. Sersik's presentation for questions, uh, questions from the audience, and we will try to provide answers. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here today and I'll be talking about liver-directed therapy for colorectal cancer. So when we think about any regional therapy, but especially liver-directed therapy, there's really three important things that we need to consider. One is why, why are we doing it? The second is when are we doing it? And the third of course is how, and these are the things that I'll go over today. So metastatic or stage four colorectal cancer, about 20% of our patients have a disease that's limited to the liver. So the tumors have metastasized or spread, but they remain limited to the liver. And we don't know why that is or who those people may be, but we do see that over time, it's really roughly about 20% of our patients. And for those patients, if it's the tumors are amenable to surgery, surgery is really the, the best treatment of choice importantly done with combination in combination with chemotherapy because we always worry about microscopic disease or, or small uh, tumors that we don't see. The goal of liver-directed therapy, so beyond surgery, what are other regional interventions that we can do, is to work with chemotherapy, sort of alongside chemotherapy or after chemotherapy to help shrink, control, or eliminate disease in the liver. When do we use it? So this is a complicated question and it's really based on a number of factors and, and most importantly on the individual patient and on the individual patient's disease. And sometimes these things are difficult to predict. Um, in some patients, we can use regional therapy to get them to surgery so they have disease on both sides of the liver. If we can shrink the disease with chemotherapy and then do a more focused or liver-directed therapy, maybe we can shrink the disease enough to get them to surgery. In other patients, we use it in combination with chemotherapy to allow chemotherapy to work better, to continue the response and be able to continue the patients on treatment. And in others, we can use it if the tumors have progressed on standard therapy. So we, if we've used our standard therapies and the disease is still in the liver or mostly in the liver, this is another area where we think about liver-directed therapy. 
So how do we do it? So this is beyond surgery. So other liver directed interventions. One is intrahepatic arterial infusion or HAI therapy. The next is radiotherapy. So radiotherapy really includes radiation of like SBRT or, or CyberKnife as you might uh, know it. Selective internal radiation using yttrium 90 uh, labeled radio uh, radio labeled beads or CERT SIRT. Um, and then tumor ablation. And there's a few different ways to do tumor ablation. The most common really is radiofrequency ablation, but, but there's a number of other ones like microwave or intratumoral injection um, of acetic acid or ethanol, as well as cryotherapy, although those are less commonly used. So this is really the tools that we have available. And the ones that we use really in part depend on the center, the academic center. Um, some depend on the physician's personal choice or personal comfort, their institution's comfort, um, although all do have some data uh, driving them, um, uh, supporting them uh, to an extent. And I'll review um, each of these uh, in this talk. So starting with hepatic arterial infusion therapy or HAI therapy, this is really, the idea here is that the tumors in the liver get their blood supply from the hepatic artery. So we have a, a venous system and an arterial system, and it's just the way that the blood flows through the liver. And, and this was many years ago, actually decades ago, we learned that the, the tumors in the liver really get their blood supply or all of their food, their nutrients from the arterial system. So the way that the pump works is that it's placed in a subcutaneous pocket. So it's placed underneath the skin, um, usually just above the waist, below the rib cage. Um, as you see here in this drawing, sometimes even a little bit higher up and on the, on the left side of the body as opposed to the right side where the liver is. Um, and then there is a catheter done and this is surgically placed into what's called the gastroduodenal artery, which is an artery that then leads into the um, arterial system of the liver. And so the idea here is that this is completely covered by the skin and that we put in chemotherapy into the pump with a syringe into this pump pocket here uh, that again is covered by the skin, just like a metaport, put the chemotherapy in. And then there is a mechanism in the pump, the current pump uh, that is most commonly used uh, is actually battery operated and the chemotherapy continuously flows into the liver, which is this area here, over a period of two weeks. And the good thing, and, and really the basic principle of liver-directed um, intraarterial therapy uh, with the HAI pump is that the liver clears the drug known as fluoxuridine or FUDR right away. So that's really the job of our liver, of our liver is to clear um, what we ingest, uh, et cetera. And so um, it clears this chemotherapy with, with what's called first pass metabolism. And by doing that, it allows us to give a very high dose of chemo that only the liver sees and predominantly the liver tumors. And there's very little absorption into the rest of the body. So it's really a, a, a way to deliver very high dose of chemotherapy to those liver tumors. And we use it in a number of ways. We use it in combination with systemic chemotherapy. We use it uh, in patients who were able to have surgery for, and, and all of their liver metastases are gone. And then we're giving chemotherapy through the liver to try to get rid of any microscopic disease that might still be there. Because we know just from studies that statistically there's a high chance of microscopic disease. So that's called adjuvant therapy, uh, liver directed therapy. Um, and it's used in metastatic tumors that are on both sides of the liver where they can't get to surgery in order to help shrink the tumors. And it works very well in that setting. Um, and then it can also be used if the disease remains in the liver predominantly, uh, but the patient is out of other uh, treatment options. So those are really the, the main ways that, that this therapy is used. What's important to keep in mind about HAI therapy is that it really requires team expertise. So the procedure is a surgical procedure. The pump is placed by experienced hepatobiliary surgeons. When the pump is put in, um, it's important to make sure that the chemotherapy is going only to the liver and not to the surrounding organs in the liver. So it's really important to look at the blood vessels. And, and, and we do this <clears throat> with the radio labeled um, substance where we look basically at a scan and see, okay, it's just the liver that's lighting up. This is good. It works. If we see that other vessels are lighting up outside of the liver, then the patient usually has to go to interventional radiology 
where they, there the physicians are able to actually intervene and tie off or embolize some of the vessels that might be supplying the chemotherapy to other organs like the stomach or the lymph nodes or, or the small intestine, because that would then be very dangerous if those organs uh, had that chemotherapy because, because unlike the liver, they're not able to get rid of it right away. So then they would really suffer the consequences of this very high dose chemotherapy into those, into those tissues. Um, there, because it's a surgical procedure, there are surgical complications, there are uh, uh, issues that can happen with the pump or the catheter that really require expert um, management. Uh, and then the, the, the other important thing to keep in mind with the pump is because we can give such a high dose of chemotherapy directly into the liver, and although we're predominantly treating the healthy liver cells, we are also giving that chemotherapy to the healthy liver cells. So it's very important to keep a very close eye on liver function tests um, in the blood to make sure that the liver is happy, that it's not stressed, that it's not inflamed, um, and that treatment is adjusted if that does happen. And there is a small risk, less than probably around 5% or so of, of this inflammation not going away and patients then developing what's called biliary sclerosis or, or real inflammation of, of the bile ducts, the very fine ducts that, that run through the liver uh, that then might need a stent uh, to keep them open. So those are all very important things. It's, it's technically challenging, but can be quite beneficial for patients, uh, as I mentioned, in a number of, of different ways. Radiotherapy, so stereotactic radiotherapy or SBRT is what I mentioned earlier, you may know as, as CyberKnife, and this is really radiation. Um, it's targeted specifically to a tumor. It's done um, as all radiation is through the skin um, on, on there's sort of a, a mold made of the body and then the, you get these radiation beams uh, directly into the liver. But what can happen is um, the small bowel sometimes is on the way, is uh, in the way and other healthy tissues. So SBRT prevents that because it's much more um, focused radiation, uh, but this is still something that we think about uh, when we consider radiation. And really in terms of treatment options, this is not at the top. We don't have such great data saying that really radiation is, is the way to go with colorectal tumors. We, there is some response, but the responses tend to not be as good as some of the other regional interventions. Nevertheless, in some cases, if just one tumor is growing, if the patient is not amenable to, if the patient can't get resection or, or can't get any of these other more invasive procedures, then this might be an option. Um, and as I mentioned, really the issue is the, the damage to the cell, healthy cells. So Y90 or CERT um, is another version of radiotherapy. And this is a very cool approach of, of radio labeled beads um, that have yttrium 90 in them. So they're like very, very fine particles of radiation with the idea that they're, they're put in through the arterial system. So similar to like a cardiac catheterization where there's a catheter that goes in through the groin and then up into the heart. This is the same idea. The catheter goes up into the groin and then into the liver and places under fluoroscopic guidance. So the interventional radiologist can see where the tumors are and instill these radio labeled beads directly into the tumor. And the idea then is that the beads are sitting there in the tumor, giving off this radiation and, and really killing the tumor, if you will, from, from within. Um, the data for this treatment um, is really best in combination with chemotherapy, but the concerns here are that there is this potential for liver damage um, because it's still radiation. It may not be as, as focused. Um, there is this significant risk of, of liver damage. So again, this approach is really also center specific. At Memorial, we tend to do much more hepatic arterial infusion. Uh, however, we do have a, a Yttrium 90 program as well. In other institutions, Yttrium 90 might be the treatment of choice uh, because it is, it is the, the most invasive or the most aggressive type of, of liver-directed therapy that, that is offered. Um, what we do know is that this approach is not um, recommended for patients with early stage disease. So newly diagnosed metastatic disease to the liver, there was a study that compared chemotherapy alone versus chemotherapy plus yttrium 90, and there was no benefit with the addition of yttrium 90, but patients did have more toxicity, um, including liver toxicity. So we tend to use it if we do in later on when the tumors have progressed on standard therapies. 
And then the next one is, is radio frequency ablation or RFA. I think this is also becoming increasingly more, more common and um, it is one of the least invasive uh, uh, procedures that I've discussed so far, similar to slightly more invasive than, than um, SBRT, but the patient here, it's, it's almost like a biopsy and a needle is placed through the skin into the liver, again, under CAT scan guidance or fluoroscopic guidance. Um, and, and then the needle is inserted into the liver. And then with um, the thermal energy, the liver is almost melting from within um, and is, is basically killed or necrosed uh, by, with that uh, mechanism. The issue with this one is that it's difficult to assess the tumor margin. So you can't quite tell if you're getting the entire tumor as it starts to literally melt away under the CAT scan. Um, and the way that we use this here is, is usually it's in patients who maybe could get undergo surgery, but are not surgical candidates or in patients where we see that they have small tumors where we think, well, surgery is, is quite aggressive. These are very small tumors. Maybe they're amenable to local control with radiofrequency ablation. And it's really best for small tumors, um, not so much for, for larger tumors. In fact, most, most places won't consider this uh, intervention unless the tumors are really around two centimeters or so, but certainly less than three. And here too, the possible complications include things like a liver abscess. There's literally a, um, a hole, if you will, where the tumor used to be. So the concern is that that could become infected and, and lead to an abscess. It's rare, but it can happen. Uh, things such as bleeding can also occur, um, which um, for the most part can be manageable. But, it, but again, these are important things that, that we need to consider with this procedure. So here we don't, with this regimen, we don't really know with this approach, we don't really know ideally based on studies, how to work it in one's treatment. And I think this is where really the individual, the individual's biology, the individual's medical history can kind of help guide us whether or not this is the right treatment approach. And then other uh, options for, for tumor ablation are microwave ablation really is the main one. There's really much more experience in small tumors in hepatocellular carcinoma or HCC. Uh, but we are starting to see a bit more of this used in, in colorectal cancer as well. And then other ones, which I just will mention um, in case they come up in our discussion, but are things like cryoablation, which is like tumor freezing or injection of ethanol or acetic acid. And I really think that this is, they are not very commonly um, uh, used for colorectal cancer. So in summary, liver-directed therapy has a role uh, in treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer involving the liver. I think most importantly, the main treatment, the initial treatment should be chemotherapy because we always worry about not just what we're seeing, not just the disease that we see in the liver, but we worry about possible microscopic disease somewhere else in the body, um, in the bloodstream, in the lymph nodes. And so really ideally, we do chemotherapy, we see how much of a response we can get. And then we start to think about, okay, depending on the scenario, if the response is very good and the disease is limited to the liver, can we do surgery? If we can't do surgery, should we do some type of regional intervention? And this is the nuances now, what will the regional interventions offer us? Will they offer us the ability for the patient to live longer? That's an obvious choice. Will they offer us the ability to take the patient off of chemotherapy because we can control the disease in the liver with some of these regional interventions? Or will they offer us the added benefit of a response that we're not getting enough of with chemotherapy alone? So all of those things are important considerations. And again, this is why it's really an important decision to, to think about each patient as on a case-by-case -case basis, and then consider all these options to determine which is best for the patient. So clearly there's no right treatment, but we are hoping that with chemotherapy, with newer therapies that we are working on and these regional interventions that we are pushing the needle forward, that we are improving outcomes for our patients with metastatic disease, because really that's what it's all about. No matter what the choice is, um, that's really all uh, we want to accomplish is to improve, improve treatment and improve outcomes for our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I'm looking forward to our discussion and welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you to all of our speakers.
Um, can everybody hear me? Maybe someone can raise a hand. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that this is working. Great. So now we have uh, time for a discussion with all of our, our, um, our speakers, our panelists, and um, we're happy to take questions. Um, perhaps we'll start with some, some questions that have come up in the chat. Um, and I'm summarizing um, some themes that um, have, have come up rather than specific questions because we've received a lot of questions, which is great. Um, so one question that has come up is about um, when tumor testing or germline testing, and I think there might be some question about tumor versus germline testing, when it should be done, how often it should be done, which tumor tissues should be uh, tested. Dr. Yeager, is, is that something you'd like to speak on? Sure, of course, thank you. Um, yeah, so I saw in the chat as well, um, and it sounds like overall the group is very informed. So we've been talking about several markers um, that we think of as tumor testing. We look for alterations within the tumor tissue. It should be done at the time of diagnosis of metastatic disease. We don't do it routinely in early stage disease because it doesn't guide treatment. But as Mark mentioned, it can guide targeted therapy in patients who have advanced disease. Once it's done, it doesn't need to be repeated. It can be done from the primary tumor, um, colon or rectal, or from any metastatic site. Um, if patients receive targeted therapy, sometimes the gen genetic change, there may be genetic changes, so your doctor may want to repeat it to look for resistance. But as a way to find match therapy, it doesn't need to be done um, repeatedly throughout the course. Um, germline testing looks um, for anything inherited from mom or dad that may have put um, someone at risk for colon cancer. Um, and that's often done in younger patients or patients who have a family history. We um, screen all patients for Lynch syndrome, which is the most common genetic syndrome. And that's usually done um, at diagnosis. It can be done on the tissue itself. Um, so that performs kind of a quick look for anything germline um, for the most common um, germline alterations. Excellent answer. Um, another question that has come up in, in various forms is um, how to find a clinical trial um, and when's the best time to look for a clinical trial. Um, I see Dr. Sursik um, in my speaker view. Um, maybe you could start by helping uh, us address this question and then we'll come back to the Perthera platform. Sure. So, so typically um, the decision for a clinical trial is, is made with the the provider, the oncologist, and and most patients, it really depends on what trials there are, the interest of the patient, and the motivation. So when we typically think about a clinical trial, it's often once the tumor has grown on all standard therapies, so the full FOX, full FERI, and even some of the targeted therapies, um, including anti-EGFR therapy or BRAF-directed therapy at this point, uh, since it's approved. And so then we think about, well, what, what might fit the patient? Is it, is it a, a totally different pathway? It, are there some alterations, um, some of which, which Dr. Yeager mentioned that might be now explored in a clinical trial? Um, um, and importantly, because the, the trials are looking at an experimental drug where we often don't know about the toxicity, we don't know the potential um, uh, side effects that the drugs can cause, it's really important for patients to be physically fit. So we always say that it's not a good idea to wait until really uh, the cancer has advanced to the point that the patient can't tolerate um, a clinical trial or, or the re requirement of going in for appointments and then and and won't be fit for a trial. So that's that's an important window to think about and something that if one is motivated for a clinical trial to bring up with their treating oncologist. Then there are trials that are also early on in um, first line therapy when that disease is first diagnosed. And that's a different kind of question. We have good therapies, but can we do better? And so that's another thing to, to think about. And I think really that's something where it takes a motivated and interested patient uh, to participate in a trial like that. But certainly it's, it's always important because it does help ad advance uh, science forward. Great. I, I was also hoping that I could mention a couple of things to add to Andrea's wonderful comments. Um, and that is that it is it is wonderful that Perthera is doing this and that they're um, making this movement into um, taking care of patients with colorectal cancer. But there is no one platform or no one clinical trial testing group or matching service that's going to give you all of the options. So, um, and, and I think that 
you know, even as if you look at different areas of the country, people use different companies. There's been a lot of questions in the chat, like which, you know, where should you get your tumor sequence? Where should you send liquid biopsies? And there are many companies and each of the platforms are a little bit different, but most of them are, are pretty good. And it really kind of depends on, on your particular doctor and what they might like or what they have. So I, I really encourage people early in their diagnosis to touch base with an area academic institution. Um, um, because even if Hopkins doesn't have every clinical trial, um, we have a large email thread among all of the people on the East Coast, and we share our patients and we share our trials. And so we can get someone up to Rona or to Andrea because um, we're talking to each other. And so um, I think getting into that system is really important um, and doing it in the way that's most convenient so that at least for that first visit, it's not like you have to travel across the country and go anywhere in particular, but just kind of getting in that mindset. Yeah, and, and uh, doctor, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. It sounds like I finally have uh, a sound back. A couple of, of things to add to the great comments already provided. Um, one, it's clearly been proven in um, most forms of cancer, and definitely in colorectal cancer, involvement in clinical trials improves outcomes. And that's an exciting thing so that the awareness of the patient group here to try to pursue those, I think is quite noteworthy. And in most of the lab testing and, and to the point just offered, you know, various labs will offer various tests. And we can say this clearly because Prothera not being a lab looks at and works with literally all of the labs across the country, or nearly all of the labs across the country. And each lab has certain strengths and, and capabilities and your physician is absolutely the right person to help direct and guide that. But what I would say is that it's also important to, to inquire with your physician to make sure that they're using the latest and greatest in technologies. And a lot of times we find that, that physicians may not be thinking of, of a clinical trial because they're only looking at uh, you know, a report that they get from one um, center, or they may be looking at their internal reports, which may not have uh, clinical trial capabilities beyond their site. And as offered uh, just previously by the two leading oncologists here, it's that it's that mosaic approach that is really important to make sure that you've got a look at on-label, off-label, and clinical trials. And as just one side example and a bit of a plug, Prothera looks at all clinical trials that are listed nationally in our, our engine, which now has machine learning from hundreds of of thousands of patients that have been brought our way through both data and, and our own pr platform itself, we really take a look at this in a manner that equips the physician to be able to make the right decisions. And historically, patients don't go much beyond 150 miles from their location. And so it's that relationship between physician, um, oncologist, and information, that confluence is really what's powerful in, in creating the care pathway for each and every patient. Great, thank you. Um, we're about out of time, but Mark, I was wondering if you wanted to um, share any parting advice with um, other patients who may be listening today. Well, uh, Hope first, that's not I, putting you on the spot too much. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, uh, first, you know, again, as I mentioned the uh, uh, last time we were together, you know, it it is incredibly comforting for every patient out there, any and and their caregivers to see all the great work that's being done and the hope that we have uh, for all the physicians to succeed in their research efforts. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, to patients uh, and, you know, what I call my fellow fighters uh, dealing, uh, confronting colon cancer, you know, uh, there is, you, you know, uh, as Gary, uh, you know, kind of eloquently said, you know, the combination of information is pretty powerful. You know, I've learned a lot here, you know, just listening to Dr. Sursik, uh, you know, uh, talk about uh, while I don't have liver uh, directed disease, it makes me ask questions about, you know, peritoneal regional disease. So I'm going to, you know, ask uh, Dr. Saltz, uh, who's my uh, honk, uh, about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so the information does provide us with a, a, another degree of comfort, uh, especially better than Dr. Google, uh, which I spent a lot of time on. And mm -hmm. Dr. Google doesn't give you really great information, but he gives you information. Um, and so, you know, to any patient out there, you know, uh, do your advice, talk to your uh, oncologist uh, and, you know, uh, research the academic areas. You know, uh, obviously, uh, 
Sloan, uh, Hopkins, uh, MD Anderson, all those, you know, uh, you know, I live outside the Pen uh, Philadelphia area. So I immediately went to Sloan and it, and it definitely changed the treatment uh, program that I was going to get. And, and, you know, to, you know, I'm a little bit of a soapbox about uh, to anybody who I meet who has cancer of any type uh, to go to one of these national uh, identified cancer centers because they are, you guys are setting the standards, uh, you know, as opposed to the community hospital. So, you know, I encourage everyone, obviously, you know, you have to know your biomarker status. Uh, you know, that seems kind of, you know, uh, as I mentioned in my little speech there, I didn't know at the time that it was important, but now it's basically allowed me to live at least three, four additional more years just by knowing that. And it gave me an incredible amount of hope and, you know, comfort to know like, oh, okay, you know, I'm not at the end of the line here. There's a, there's treatments that available. So, you know, uh, so those are the two things, you know, thank you to the doctors, uh, you know, you guys, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the, you know, patients are in the stands rooting for you guys, cheering you guys on, hoping, you know, we'll, we'll cheer you as loud as we can to help you uh, pursue uh, all the options you have and all the things you're thinking about to help us. And it's, uh, it is incredibly comfort to see how brilliant you guys are and how much you're, how hard you're working at us uh, to help us uh, since we can't really help ourselves. Uh, you know, I'm in marketing that doesn't really help me uh, fight my disease, but you guys do. And, and I appreciate that. And my family appreciates that. And the, the world of cancer patients appreciate that. And to all the patients out there, you know, we're all capable. You know, I say this all, all the time. We're so much more capable uh, than we realize. And in this fight, there's never a reason to give up, especially when you've got a team of doctors like you guys out there. So thank you very much. Thank you to everybody for, for joining today. No one's giving up. Um, everybody stay safe and stay in touch. Thank you so much. Thanks to all. Thanks for the opportunity.